Okay, Mr. Beltran, you're up. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, and I'd like to reserve uh, five minutes for rebuttal, please. Um, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Michael Beltran. I represent the landlord in this case. Um, this is a commercial lease case, and the trial court used parole evidence in violation of the statute of frauds and ignored the lease's non-waiver provision to rewrite the lease to half the rent and double the leasehold. The court did me, so by me, imposing on back, Let me come back. Let me come back. You, you, you have two primary complaints, as I gathered. I mean, do they boil down to the occupation of the building that's not in the written lease and the rent provision? That's correct. That's what the, the trial court did. And, and, and that's it. That's that's what the dispute is, correct? That's what that's what our appeal is. Yes, Your Honor. But there's no question, for instance, and in, in taking them one at a time, that the the the, the go kart company uh, business was occupied initially that that building. And I don't recall there there's an you guys call it something for re referred to registration it. building registration building. Uh, with the permission of your client correct to begin with well I'd, I'd like to clarify yes we're not alleging that they broke in but they didn't occupy it at least inception well yeah but i well, i guess what i'm going to get to is wasn't that 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 clearly was an, an oral modification of the lease agreement was it not well you can't modify the lease uh through oral promises but they not promise what happened is the con construction didn't go as planned and they I guess they went in, we either acquiesced or- well, I mean, or... I, I, I was looking at the lease, which clearly was not drafted by, you know, I don't, it doesn't look to be drafted by an attorney to me, but anyway, it doesn't have an integration clause. It doesn't say it can't be modified orally. Well, the integration clause is really um, accretive to the parole evidence rule. That's why you have the parole evidence rule and there's a case. Well, the parole, parole evidence rule applies to promises made at the time of the agreement was entered into. This would have been a post agreement modification. That's correct. And that's why we have a non waiver provision, which says that if we allow a waiver or, or variance from the lease, then if we can basically take it back later or we can say that was a one time thing and now we're going to enforce the strict terms of the lease, that's section 19 of the lease. That has a non waiver provision. So that really does a lot of the same work. And then you have Not non waiver, well. non waiver of a violation of the lease. Well, yeah, if, you, if you're occupying parts but, but of the if you, property. But if you, if you, if the, if the parties entered into an oral agreement that they, that the defendant could occupy that building, that would not have been a violation of the lease, correct? We're not saying that they did something wrong when they occupied the building, but there, first of all, there's no consideration for that. Second of all, it's it's a oral it would be an oral modification of a written lease that's more than a year, so that's a statute of frauds. Okay, the pro. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to sort this. It, it, I think you'll agree this this case was a total mess. Correct. I'll um, agree with that. Both total parties. mess, and I'm just oh. trying to put it in some sort of cubby holes that I can figure out. I'm sure you you guys have too, but so there you go. I well, both parties replaced their trial counsel. I, I get it. I get it. No, I get. This is not your fault. I understand, <laughs> and and believe me, I've been on your side of the podium uh, when it wasn't my fault too. So I understand. Okay. Um. So if if I kind of answered your questions for I now, didn't just throw you off. So the the court um imposed on the landlord duties that the lease clearly assigned to the tenant, right? So the section ten of the lease says that the maintenance and any alterations of the premises and inspections and all that, that is the obligation compliance with government regulation. That's all on the tenant. We did sign an investment agreement. The investment agreement says we're going to give money. And of course, we're allowed to inspect under the lease. But at no time did my client say, I'm a general contractor. That's not in the documents. That's not in the lease. That's not in the investment agreement. But the court somehow held my client responsible for uh, all the problems with the construction. Now, with, I agree, like just, just like the trial, the construction, the construction wasn't done the way the, the parties wanted that to be done either. So as both the construction was- But the evidence, the evidence was, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the so-called investment agreement is, you know, lacking in some significant detail as well. Um, and, 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 but clearly everyone testified that there was this, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but 
I think it was undisputed that everyone agreed that the idea was that uh, your client was going to significantly improve this property and collect more. And, and as a result of his investment and improvements of the property was going to be, have an interest in the business and the business would pay much higher rent. I guess I, 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 I the property was definitely going to be improved. The obligation to carry that out when is assigned by the lease to the tenant. So my so, client. So, but, but, but it, is it, is it, is it disputed that he was the one though that had buildings knocked down? The most of the agreements, well, all right. Mr. Downs is the principal of the tenant and Mr. Shabiri is the principal of the right. landlord. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them dealt with the workmen, if you will, to some extent. Uh, Mr. Shabiri was the money guy. Mr. Downs was at the property day to day. Mr. Shabiri came by from time to time and inspected it. There was testimony that he had a uh, a, a roller that was used to measure and so forth. Uh, but the fact is, is the testimony is also that Mr. Downs selected several of the workmen, that the general contractor was, I think, went back some time with Mr. Downs. They were friends for 25 years. A lot of the vendors were actually dealt with Mr. Downs probably more than they dealt with Mr. Shabiri. And there's nothing anywhere that says uh, Mr. Shabiri is other than you know that the tenant's testimony that says that Mr. Shabiri is some kind of a general contractor or he's qualified or prepared to superintend what the investment agreement says and again that wasn't not you know, much it says not much well what, what it says is it says it's what it does say is important is that Mr. Shabiri is going to give money the the 300 equity the 200 debt he's going to get 50 percent and that's that's the beginning and the end of of the investment agreement if right. it said Mr. Shabiri was going to superintend uh, the contract, then that would, that would, you know, well, you know, no one, no, there was no writing about who was going to, who was going to accomplish these improvements. I disagree, Your Honor. Section 10 of the lease says that maintenance and alterations, 10B is alterations. It says, and it, it also says you have to make sure you're complying with the government uh, permits and regulations and so forth. That's in the lease. That's in the 10 year lease that the tenant signed. It says that they have to deal with all of those things. It's a triple nut lease and that's valuable that's something valuable that we bargain for because if it's not triple net, then the monthly rent has to be higher because we got to cover the taxes, insurance, and maintenance. But that's not what we bargained for. We bargained that they were going to take uh, take those responsibilities. We were going to pay money or they were going to pay money to us as the case was. And that was going to be our obligation under the lease. We provided the property. We provided the equity. We provided uh, the debt portion. And that was that. And then, yeah, we did inspect. I'm not saying Mr. Shabiri never came by, that there's an inspection right there in 10C of the lease. It says that you have an inspection, uh, an inspection right. And of course, he invested half a million dollars and it's his property and he's supposed to be getting this rent. And yeah, he did come to the property from time to time and see what was going on. That's perfectly legitimate. If he's, he's the one writing checks. I'm not saying he did anything wrong. I'm just trying to figure out what happened, who knocked the building down. Well, so the, so the buildings were Mr. Downs, there was testimony, Mr. Downs arranged for the roof to be replaced. Mr. Downs contracted that, the, Your Honor, the problems with the construction project started when there was a gentleman named Stevens. He was supposed to repave the facility. He deals with Mr. Downs. He says, I'm going to do a banked track rather than a flat track. And Mr. Downs agrees to that. Um, Mr. Stevens basically messes everything up and then he absconds and he doesn't do the work that he was supposed to do that. There's a criminal restitution order that's entered against Mr. Stevens, the, the paving contractor. And in that proceeding, there was a criminal proceeding and a civil proceeding. In the civil proceeding, this is all in the record, Mr. Downs, the principal of the, of the tenant, assigns all of the blame to this third-party paving contractor. He says that this guy caused a whole bunch of problems, and we outlined all of those problems in our brief. So if, uh, I mean, if the, the case is going to turn around or on who messed up the construction, uh, first of all, the obligations assigned to the tenant, but even if you didn't find that, it was a third party who came in and he, he committed a crime. He committed a crime. He it was essentially conversion and they entered a restitution order in a criminal case. And that, that all was laid somehow by the trial judge at the feet of my client. And that's the part of the construction aspect of the case that I don't understand. Mr. Belcher, I, I want to ask one question about the statute of frauds because I don't, I don't think either party really addressed it. But there is case law that talks about partial performance that is offered and accepted 
is an exception to the statute of frauds. Uh, then there's a fourth DCA case that I remember reading that talked explicitly about that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Your Honor. So there's a case uh, called uh, Cawley versus Rebel. It's cited in our brief. It's out of the third DCA. And um, it essentially, it says that if the partial performance is an equivocal act, in other words, it neither supports nor rebuts one party's position, uh, then the part performance uh, cannot be used to modify. So what was the part performance? Well, Mr. Shabiri, first of all, he let them into the property, right? He let them into the south of the driveway. And as I discussed with Judge North, Northcutt, north of, the, north of the driveway, so so far, so good. That's the lease agreement. And then he paid some money. So far, so good. That's the investment agreement. It doesn't support the proposition that Mr. Shabiri was supposed to be primarily responsible for the construction. Well, it doesn't so before, before we get to that part of it, isn't the fact that they had to vacate their premises in order for construction to be performed also performance? Because it doesn't seem like there's any dispute. They didn't voluntarily close down the track. They left it moved into the adjacent building, and then there was some stoppage because of construction, correct? You know, the record's not terribly clear on that point. Um, I guess they there was definitely they definitely used the registration building at some point. Uh, they're, they're, the track may have been down uh, at one point, but that doesn't, nobody made an agreement to vacate the track or, in fact, they made an agreement, and this is important, the agreement started at the beginning of 2015. The agreement was to pay rent. If the, the parties were going to say, okay, we're going to do for 18 months, we're not going to charge any rent, then it should have started in the middle of 16 or in 17 or whenever. They didn't say that in the lease agreement. They said, you know, the rent starts, uh, I think, I believe it was January 1st of 2015. Uh, so the there's, there's nothing that the parties did that's inconsistent that there's a 10-year lease. And then... Well, it wasn't, wasn't not, there, there were... There appear to have been several significant changes, one of which was that your client wanted to get paid $20,000 instead of $10,000. So you know, th there are a lot of facts that are in play here. And I'm what I've been trying to get a handle on is how much of this is a matter for resolution by the fact finder, as opposed to, I think, a couple of the arguments you're making are as a matter of law, your client should have won. And one of those is the statute of frauds. And so I'm trying to get a handle on how this all interplays, recognizing that neither uh, of uh, neither appellate counsel was involved in creating this problem. So help yeah, me so understand I, that. Sure. Yeah, so, so essentially my argument, I mean, my argument on the first point, Judge uh, Northcutt kind of cut to the chase. We're concerned about the rent and the addition of the... Uh, registration building as to the, there's another bifurcation in the case right and the first the first part of my appeal is statute of frauds parole evidence rule non-waiver provision of the lease you're not supposed to rewrite contracts the second part of the um the appeal uh which i, I think i went on the first i think i went on the law but if we get to the facts the second part of the appeal is based on the record as i i mean i take the record as i find it as i was retained you know basically when the trial proceeding was over I take that record as I find it, but looking at that record, I don't see how Judge Meyer got to where he did. I mean, he had the lease in front of him. The lease says that the tenant's supposed to maintain. The um, I cited a lot of the trial testimony, and the trial testimony is not that Downs went to Tahiti for 18 months and Mr. Shabiri was there working. In fact, Downs was there with his employees. His employee testified, I saw Mr. Shabiri. I was there. Mr. Shabiri, and this is an important fact, Mr. Shabiri, uh, was registered on SunBiz and the, as pursuant to the investment agreement that he's going to be a vice president of Cardi. So he's acting as an agent of Cardi, right? He's doing that. He's vice president of Cardi. They know that. He's on their bank accounts. He puts money into their bank accounts. He writes checks out of their bank accounts. They write checks out of their bank accounts. He's acting as an agent of Cardi. And yet they're saying they're trying to hold him either individually liable or liable as a principal or an agent of 34th Street, the landlord, for all these problems. And there's nothing, in the, 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 only, the only document that we have that assigns, uh, other than supplying money, that assigns any obligation in connection with construction is the lease agreement, which puts that clearly on the tenant's shoulders. And there's nothing about the party's course of conduct or course of dealing that says that, that or that shows that the, the parties departed from that, that the liability was not always on the downs pursuant to the lease agreement. And so if the court's going to depart 
or Judge Meyer is going to depart from the four corners of the lease agreement, I think it needs much, much better evidence. And I, I don't think we even get to look at that evidence under the doctrines that we've discussed. Okay, Mr. Beltran, so, you, you, you're down to five minutes. We've helped you use okay. up time so far. Okay. So anyway, use them as you please. I'll, uh, I'll reserve. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lambert. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Jason Lambert, and I appear on behalf of uh, Terry and Bobby Downs and Pro Carding Experience, the Appleese. Um, there, are, there are basically three reasons that this court should affirm the, the judgment below, and I'll get to a couple of the questions that were asked as well. But the, the first is that the, the parallel evidence rule simply doesn't apply here. Um, the agreement, as Judge Northcutt pointed out, doesn't have an integration clause. And it's not a complete agreement between the parties. That's, uh, that's evident from the day and a half of testimony about all the things that happened after the lease was signed that the parties were doing pursuant to what they believed they were supposed to be doing under the lease. Um, furthermore, in addition to, in addition to that, uh, the parallel evidence rule doesn't apply in cases of fraud or mistake. So even assuming the parties... Uh, we're doing these things, uh, you know, out of some error or something else that doesn't per, uh, prohibit it. Turning to the statute of frauds and the second reason why this court should affirm the trial court's ruling, the statute of frauds doesn't apply here and can't be considered by this court because it was never asserted as an affirmative defense below. And it was raised quite literally twice as an evidentiary objection and was overruled by the trial court. That's the only way that it came up below. And I'll provide the court the record citations in a moment. Um, but further, the statute of frauds is not applicable to reformation cases where it's waived or where the parties intended to complete the agreement in less than a year. And so to the extent uh, the appellants here are trying to cast this as some sort of separate agreement that the statute of frauds would apply to or modification that the statute of frauds would apply to, it just doesn't apply to the facts here. Um, and then finally, there is clear and convincing evidence in the record uh, to support the trial court's conclusions uh, that are reached in making the determination that it needed to reform the lease that it did here. Um, I'd like to jump uh, first, if I could, let me, let me <clears> to Judge Silverman's back. question. Let me come back Sorry. to that, Mr. Lambert. So your view is your client can occupy a building that's not on the written lease and that for equitable reasons it can be even though this wasn't contemplated at the inception of the lease for, because of things that happened thereafter the judge can reform the lease as some sort of remedy to something to include that building yes your honor uh and that's for two reasons first off if you look at the evidence before the trial court for example the trial transcript at page 132 there's testimony that uh mr shabiri told uh, the Downses and Pro Carding that they could use that building. Um, there's a couple of other places in the record that that appears. And the and that evidence is the agreement. And so the court so, you know, can- I guess, I guess, I, guess the, I, I view it differently. I view that as like an oral modification of the lease as opposed to like a reformation of the agreement. Well, yeah. uh, under the under the reformation case law, it's it's an equitable remedy that the trial court is able to use in order to have the document conform to what was really intended ultimately by the parties. Well, no, and, what was intended, what was intended when the agreement was reached, when the document was was signed, not what came later. Correct. Well, I, I would I would disagree with that, Your Honor, because I think that not only is it a circumstance here where the parties, I think the parties, because they didn't have a writing in the lease that explained all these uh, construction activities that were going to happen, I think that as they go forward and they do these things and uh, Mr. Shabiri uh, demolishes, you know, three-fifths of the building on the property and removes all the parking and removes all the functional bathrooms at the property, uh, I think it becomes, it could have been something that they intended upon uh, this being a term of the agreement that, hey, during construction, we're going to let you use this. And so I think the court, based on the evidence before it uh, presented at trial, was within its right to reform the lease to incorporate that provision to it, as well as to incorporate uh, the rental term, or excuse me, the uh, rental amount and the, um, and the occupation of that building. Uh, 
And again, uh, once the lower court makes those decisions, that's a fact-finding decision, just like Judge Silverman mentioned. And unless there is clear error or clearly no sufficient evidence to support it, um, then it, it must be uh, affirmed uh, on appeal. And here there's a lot of evidence to support the idea that the parties uh, you know, moved forward in this direction and that this was how the lease was going to function. Um, part of that being that, uh, again, in the transcript at page 286, um, Mr. Downs testified that Mr. Shabiri made promises before, during, and after, as they're going through uh, the issues at the property, that he made repeated promises regarding the buildings that were going to be constructed, the work that was going to be done, um, the plans that were being provided, the permits that were being issued. Uh, Tom Tafelski, who was uh, the Downs' expert at trial, testified on page 162 of the transcript that of 24 documents relating to the construction out there, meaning the contracts, invoices, and plans that were put of record, only three were in the Downs' name, and the rest were in either a combination of the landlord's name, the landlord's management company, or Mr. Shabiri individually. Hey, and so... Can I, can I turn to another aspect of this, which is the, the rent adjustment? Um, and, and clarify for me that the, the scenario that occurred. So at some point, um, there was, I don't know, a forbearance or as Mr. Beltran would point out, maybe a, you know, a, not a waiver in the future, but they, they, your client paid less than the 20,000 uh, with everyone's acknowledgement that, should, that they should pay less or none, I suppose. Um, and what, did, would this correspond with the move into the registration building? I mean, at what point are they paying no rent or less than the 20? Yes, Your Honor. Under the um, uh, the actions of the parties and the testimony at trial reveal that uh, during the course of construction and until the business was supposed to be back up and running, uh, rent was going to be suspended. And actually at the transcript at page 254, that's where there's some discussion and testimony about the rent being suspended until the business was able to reopen. Okay. The business so, didn't re okay. The business did eventually reopen. It did, Your Honor, yes. time of trial, it was up and running. Uh, I'm sorry, say that one more time. time of trial, it was up and running. Yes, Your Honor. Why are they not paying the full rent? Because the parties agreed that at that point in time, once they reopened uh, on page 258 of the trial transcript, Mr. Shabiri asked them to start paying $2,500. I believe it was $2,500 a week, which would essentially be $10,000. Um, and uh, the transcript at 285, Mr. Downs testifies regarding a check that's in the record uh, that was paid as part of this agreement. And so the parties uh, continued uh, to do that and to make those rent payments um, as, again, as accepted by the landlord and as requested by the landlord once they had been back up and running for a sufficient amount of time to develop uh, cash flow in order to support paying rent. And the reason for that, the reason for that delay in not paying any rent and then ultimately paying that amount of rent is because Mr. Shabiri had told them uh, that he wanted them to focus on paying off the construction debts related to the improvements at the project or the work at the project so that there wouldn't be which liens had on this under, property. Which had been undertaken by the tenant at that point. Uh, yes, after Mr. Shabiri came out, demolished the buildings, and ultimately failed at construction, the tenants had to take over. Okay, so if this was an agreement, again, potentially an oral modification of the, of the agreement, why were there experts testifying about a reasonable rent in the trial? Isn't this a contract case? It, it is, Judge, and I think that the reason that there were experts testifying about that uh, was to illustrate that the the checks that were being paid were a reasonable amount of rent uh, that had been requested and to illustrate intended to corroborate in intended to corroborate your client's version. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, Your Honor. It supports my client's testimony and supports the actions of the parties, uh, not only as to support 
uh, why the Downses and Pro Carding would be paying essentially ten thousand dollars a month, but also why Thirty uh, Fourth Street and Mr. Shabiri would be accepting uh, ten thousand dollars a month for this particular property. Shifting to the uh, the statute of frauds, I do want to touch on uh, one more point related to the the statute of frauds here, um, and I believe uh, the fourth DCA case. I think that Judge Silverman, you might have been thinking about, might have been the DK Arena case, which ultimately went up onto uh, to the Florida Supreme Court on appeal, and ultimately uh, the Florida Supreme Court does uh, essentially say, you know, we're not going to recognize promissory estoppel as a defense to the statute of frauds. Uh, but we do see that there's case law relating to the part performance of it, and we do see that there are cases uh, relating to where a party can waive uh, through a waiver, ultimately uh, eliminate the statute of frauds. And I think that happened here in uh, in a couple of respects. As an initial matter, and, and this also, also speaks to uh, why the parallel evidence rule doesn't apply and why this case is so different from the cases that are relied upon by the appellants here. In so many of the parallel evidence cases and in so many of the statute of frauds cases, there's a discussion or an agreement and then one party maybe does something, but the other party never performs. The other party never does anything in furtherance of the agreement or the modification that's contended to be you know covered by either the parallel evidence rule or the statute of frauds. And here we have a very different circumstance. We have both parties who signed this lease, that there's testimony in the record that the leases between them repeatedly had uh, mistakes in them and, and were intended to be adjusted down the road. And then they both go forward with doing this work out at the property. And so if you look, for example, just at the, the dates of when things happen out here, um, page uh, 795 of the record is a set of drawings dated January 19th, 2015. There's an invoice to 34th Street or Mr. Shibiria, page 811 of the record, dated January 30th, 2015. And it goes on, there's 14 documents total in the record uh, over the course of 2015 and 2016 relating to uh, construction or improvements at the property that illustrate that the, the parties are going forward with this. And that really eliminates part of the application of the parallel evidence rule. It also eliminates the application of the statute of frauds, assuming for the sake of argument that it even can be raised at this point in time. Um, and, and so when you look at it uh, in that particular context, uh, it really takes this case outside of a lot of the cases that were relied upon by the appellants <clears throat> in reaching the, or in making the arguments that they, uh, that they made here. Now, I do also want to touch on the Mr. statute Mr. Lever, of frauds. Before you go, before you go yes, to sir. your next argument, uh, the complaint by the appellant was for some equitable relief and ejectment from the registration building. There was no effort to have the existing lease declared void or no longer in effect, was there? No, Your Honor, there was not. And your counterclaim sounded in fraud, and uh, there were, I think, three counts, if I recall correctly. And the only request relating to modification of the lease was, I think, in the last count for fraud, where it said to revise the lease. And I'm, I'm always you know, looking at this record and the arguments that were made in the trial court in here, it almost seems like the original lease was somewhat abandoned. And now there's a new lease that the court has put into effect. And I understand the court called it reformation, but reformation is typically, I think Judge Northcutt brought out, typically something that was misunderstood at the time the lease was created. You know, we have a, a whole shifting lease situation and I, I'm I'm troubled by that. Well, I, uh, I do, before I address your question, if I could, Your Honor, in, and we have two, there were two case numbers below that were consolidated. And in one of the cases, the complaint is exactly as you just described with three counts. In the other case, which I think is between the entities, uh, page 374 of that record has a counterclaim in it, an amended counterclaim that specifically brings a claim for reformation. Um, so there was more than just the request for relief in the fraud count. There was a specific claim brought uh, for reformation. But shifting to... Uh, was uh, that this... claim ever specifically dealt with in the trial court? I, I candidly just don't recall that. 
I know what the court did, but I don't recall that being teed up for the trial court. I mean, it was in that the trial court was uh, both cases were I don't know if they were officially consolidated or just traveling together. But the trial court's final order deals with all of the claims and relief and defenses Mm. sought in both cases. Um, And in fact, the last line of it uh, of the final judgment here, I think, says, you know, if it's not addressed in this judgment, then it's denied, you know, for lack of evidence or something to that effect. So the reformation claim was properly before the court. It was properly pleaded, and then the court, based on the evidence, uh, put together the final judgment that it did based on uh, based on reformation. Um, the and I'm sorry, shifting to sort of the the original question uh, that dealt with uh, that particular issue here. I think when you look at the the lease, I, I don't know that it's that the parties necessarily abandoned it. They certainly didn't abandon it in litigation. Everybody seemed to try to shoehorn or bolt things onto this document to keep it traveling through. Um, But I think it's important to point out a couple of things that Judge Northcutt noticed. There's not an integration clause in the lease. There's no language in there regarding modification, saying that modifications have to be in writing or that modifications have to be agreed to. And finally, uh, the anti-waiver language that's included in the lease is is purely prospective and it actually doesn't give the landlord the right to uh come back later on and just make a unilateral change once the parties have made an adjustment to the agreement uh the landlord's waiver provision it's on page 486 of the record states landlord's waiver of a breach of one covenant or condition of this lease is not a waiver of a breach of others or a subsequent breach of the one waived that's only applicable to breaches of the lease. If the parties agree that going forward, the lease is going to be modified in a certain way, that waiver provision doesn't, it's not a catch-all. It doesn't help them in any way. It helps them if the lease is ultimately breached, they waive that, and then they want to enforce that later on. And that's simply not the circumstances that we have here. And then I know I'm just about out of time here, but I want to address one last section of the lease uh, that was brought up by appellant, and that's the section uh, 10 that they claim um, contemplates the tenants being responsible for improvements. And section 10B, which would deal with alterations to the property, simply uh, requires that um, the tenant shall not, without prior written consent of the landlord, make any alterations, additions, or improvements. And uh, so, A, the landlord has to be involved in that at all times because consent is required. And further, the tenant understands that the landlord may condition its consent upon tenant adequate securing adequate bonds or other security to protect fully the landlord's interest in the premises. And here, if we're going to try to shoehorn everything into this lease, then I think that the uh, uh, Mr. Shabiri, there was testimony at trial in um, – Uh, page 254 of the record and then on 255 of the record again that stated that Mr. Shabiri uh, had them hold off on the lease so the business could grow and then ultimately they could make payments to it. I I think there's an argument that that's the landlord making sure that he has a tenant there who can pay him in order to secure his interest in the improvements that are being done out there. And so again, I don't think any of this uh, reflects that the trial court was outside uh, the bounds or outside of what it was allowed to do based on the claims and the evidence before it. Uh, and so we would ask that the court affirm uh, the Let final judgment that clarify was clarify under- then the status of things. Uh, under- I'm sorry. Let me clarify then, and Mr. Beltran can speak to this too when he comes on rebuttal. Okay. As things stand, as a result of this judgment, the, the your view is the lease now includes the registration building. And the rent is ten five a month, and this will go till the expiration of the January 1, 2015 lease, which will be January 1, 2025. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And, and sorry, and I believe there's an extension period in there. But yes, as it sits, yes, Your Honor, that would be the timing of it. Okay. All right. Mr. Um, Mr. Beltran, you're up for rebuttal. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Judge. And, and you're, you're correct that we... We actually have an escalator in the uh, lease and they're not even paying the escalator because they say that this judgment uh, not only uh, half the rent and doubled the premises, but that we don't have to, they don't have to pay the taxes and they don't have to pay the escalator. And I proffered that into the record, but 
I, I, a couple, uh, Judge Northcutt and uh, Mr. Lambert mentioned this integration clause. I cited Jenkins versus Eckerd in my brief. Uh, Jenkins versus Eckerd uh, cites to a case called Gulf Atlantic Towing versus Dickerson out of the Fifth Circuit, pre uh, Fifth Circuit split. And um, what it says essentially is that the parole evidence rule creates a presumption of integration in a contract. Uh, and so integration clause is nice. You're correct. I didn't draft this. It, it wasn't done you know, with all the bells and whistles, but it's really belt and suspenders when you have the parole evidence rule. That's the purpose of the parole evidence rule. Uh, there's a case we cited in the brief we haven't discussed. It's called Beach Resort Hotel. It was a renovation case. It was a dispute between the landlord and tenant. And it comes out our way in, this, in the sense that you don't get to rewrite the lease in order to penalize one side because you think they did something wrong or they messed up. Now, they didn't pay rent, that's true. Uh, that's the breach. Uh, but if it's not the breach, then the rent abatement has to be part of the investment agreement, right? We had to put 500,000, 200 debt, 300 equity. Um, so if you're saying that it's not the breach, then it has to be part of the investment agreement. And it wasn't, we didn't waive anything until we were paid up. And then prior waiver doesn't result in um, ongoing waiver. We, by the way, we never got our shares issued and they disavow the debt. So they've disavowed both the debt and the equity portion of the investment agreement. So that's not part performance. Now, as the court noted, you only rewrite to reflect original intent. You can never rewrite because problems arose later. And there's not a single case that allows a court to rewrite a commercial lease in the way that was done here. There was no mistake that would justify using the uh, parallel evidence rule. I, I listed they, their trial testimony. They said, which building is which? And the tenant was able to identify the buildings without any kind of trouble using the street address, pointing to a map. There was no trouble. That's all cited in uh, page four of my brief. Um, <clears throat> and then they said, we removed the buildings. This is as if First, they say we had the obligation to fix the place up. Then they're complaining that we demolished buildings or we made modifications to the premises. Well, which one is it? Mr. Shabiri didn't come there in the night and vandalize the place. They were workmen. They were hired by the tenant. It was financed by the landlord. Everyone knew what was going on. We didn't do some destructive or malicious thing. The trial court calls it willful misdeeds, not even negligence, not recklessness. He says we did willful misdeeds. That is not supported by the record. OK, the we signed some items and put them in our name. I don't disagree with that. The reason we did that is because we were paying. We were the owner and the workmen either wanted to have a lien on the property or they wanted to have privity with whoever was obligated uh, to pay. And then the other question about all these oral modifications is all of them run to the tenant. They never said we're going to give you a thousand bucks, 500 bucks, 50 cents for all of these. Uh, we're going to occupy the registration building, we're going to half the rent, we're going to issue you more shares. There was never any consideration. So even if it's an oral modification, you still need consideration and abiding by the investment agreement or the lease, that's a pre-existing obligation that can't support the consideration in order to modify the lease. The bottom line here, judges, is you can't do something south of the driveway and extend the lease north of the driveway. There's no question that the property north of the driveway, the trial court, Mr. Downs, everyone acknowledges the pro pro property north of the driveway wasn't part of the lease and they didn't occupy that until they kind of hit a, hit, a, hit a roadblock in the construction. That wasn't the party's original intent. The party's original intent wasn't for the 10,005 because they wrote 20 in the lease. The party's original intent was not to occupy north of the driveway in the registration building because that's not in the lease um, either. And as to preservation, I put in my reply at pages six to seven, there were a number of times we raised this, uh, the court at page 10 of the trial transcript, right at the beginning, um, <clears throat> my predecessor in the trial court tried to argue a motion and eliminate. He said, well, we're not, we don't have time for that now. We're going to get started, but I'm going to consider uh, those arguments as we go. And he never acknowledged them in nine pages of the final judgment. We pressed them. We pressed them during the trial. We pressed them in closing. We pressed them in pretrial motions. We pressed, the, pressed them on reconsideration. So they weren't waived, whether they were pleaded. Uh, rule 1.190B says that you can try issues by consent. And that was what was done here. Nobody argued waiver below. And so my contention here is they waived waiver. And I said that in my brief, the uh, statute of frauds uh, in particular. So um, <clears throat> how, how much time do I have left? Uh, you got me. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm teasing. You're down to about a minute, Mr. Bell. Okay. All right. Th thank, thank you, Judge. Um, 
so the uh, it's not so it's not just the performance that waves that allows you if you do some performance then you can say that there's any oral modification they don't identify any performance that was performed by by my client that waves the rent or allows them to do the registration building that wasn't the that wasn't the performance okay because that wasn't the original agreement if we had made an oral argue, oral agreement and then they said okay well you partially performed but what did we do to perform that they're saying that that was part of the original agreement and we performed part of the original agreement we didn't do that and the the idea that they weren't going to pay rent until the construction was complete well one way or another the construction's complete the record clearly establishes that uh the tenant got their business going their business is going so now they have to pay rent whether they're making an argument from 2015 to mid 2016 they didn't have to pay rent i mean that's one little sliver of our claim that doesn't mean in 2022 soon to be 2023 uh, that you don't pay the rent for the rest of the lease and that you don't pay according to the escalator and according to the uh triple net with the insurance and taxes and all of that okay uh, so you're down to that into that minute mr bell yeah. thank you judge i would uh, request that the court um remand for a new trial thank you thank you both very much uh it's an interesting case a little more so than i think we all would wish so <laughs> uh, you can leave our virtual courtroom by clicking the leave button that is on the zoom screen and then 